I was just driving in, and I was driving the Bronco. The old 74 Bronco nice. that we've rebuilt. I say we've. I've done nothing to it. I don't know anything about cars, and you'll see where this is going in a second. We we got it, and my wife was just like, I'd love an old Bronco, because they do look cool, but they're impossible to find. Right. So we start looking at some of these car dealerships that have um, older exotic cars, because sometimes they have Broncos, older Broncos. And we went to one here in town, and they're like, we don't have anything, but we can put you on a list and call you as soon as we get it. Okay. And we're like, okay, cool. And does that mean we have to buy it, though, if you call us? Because we had to sign something, and... They're like, no, 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 but you're just committing to us that you're serious about it. All right. Like dibs on it. Whatever you want. Yeah. yeah. What does that mean? It's like calling shotgun. Like, I'm like, yeah. So they call us and they say, we have one. It's blue. Now, I really wanted a red one, but my wife thinks everything I have is too red anyway. Love the color red. And so we drive up to it, and it's this Bronco we have now, but it's, uh, it's got many more of the 1974 parts in it. And right. it, it is, it drives like, I don't even know how they traveled back then in this thing. It was a horse and buggy. <laughs> Barely ran. And I said, we'll take it. And it was not cheap because, again, they're in such high demand, these old Broncos. Yeah. It was like $80,000 old. Old. Yep. We're like, okay, we'll take it. So we get it. Investment. We call that kind of thing an investment, don't we? I guess, but they say... That as soon as you drive it, it goes down in value. But that thing's been driven a lot, and it's gone up in value. So, yes, let's just call it an investment. Yeah. So we get it, drive it home. And we're getting married, like, two weeks later. And so clean it up real good. We drive it off and are leaving the wedding situation where we just drove to oh, yeah. the hotel. Cans, yeah. just married sign. Yes. All that. Yep. Yeah. Which we really just drove over to our, my manager Tom's house and then traded and got in a real car and drove to the hotel that we stayed at until we left the next morning for a honeymoon. And so as we're gone, I had one of my friends take it. And we're going to get some stuff fixed on it. I know nothing about cars. Okay. And driving it, boom, somebody nails it on the highway. Interstate. I'm talking about the whole front side is just dented in and it's the, the axle thing is bent and the, i don't even know what to call these parts and so i got a picture of it i'm like oh my god and so they're like hey it's totaled and i'm like no, no I, I don't want it to be totaled because it was so hard to find it's like can we not total it like what's it going to cost to not total it because totaling it as you probably know is if it's going to take more to fix than the value is yeah so i say let's not total it just give me the value that you can give me, and I'll pay more because we wanted to make it drivable anyway. So they say, okay. So they give me the money, take it to a body shop. They also work on, you know, older, cooler cars. And I say, I don't want a standard anymore. I want an automatic, and I don't care about it being all real. I just want it to look cool and drive easy. They changed out the steering column. I've learned what that is. They put in a new engine. They it's it's also on a lift. It's like a two inch lift. It's so they replace the old lift, and I get it. It's and it's driving. So I mean, it's it's awesome, right? And sounds awesome. For the first time, it's like I'm 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 just loving. I'm driving it. I'm just driving it today. And I used to think people love the radio show, and they would be like, "Hey, wave at me." But they don't. They just love the truck. So the truck is more love than I am when I'm driving it around. So it's super cool, and. I'm driving home just a minute ago. I just, I just drove up after maybe like what thirty seconds before he did. Yeah. And I was thinking about you because you have a Jeep. Yeah. And it started to rain on me when I was in this Bronco, and I'm like, oh god, no! I don't have a top. There's no top on it. Oh, not so, even a soft top or anything. Soft top in the garage. Oh, it's, I have a, no, it's a full I, removable situation. No, no, I don't okay. Want, I don't want a soft. I don't want any top on it at all. And so I'm driving. It starts to rain on me, and I'm thinking. I hope Morgan's top is off too, so he's also getting wet. And that's very <laughs> selfish of me. Yeah, right. And I'll say it. As I was driving here, I thought to myself, I hope Morgan's top is off his Jeep and he's also getting wet, and then we can relate and bond. And, we, and I saw your Jeep and the top is on it. Top's on, man. So I'd just like to say, you're a wuss for having your top on. And that's where this all goes <laughs> well, to. I'm glad We're we got We're all the that. way back around. Well, I want to go check out this Bronco yes. now. That's was amazing. All right, so... Um, you leave the top on all the time, or are you gone so much that you just leave the top on in case because you can't really predict the weather? 
Um, yeah, well, I'm going to the airport after this anyway, so kind of need the top on for that. So, which is my point. So you can't really. How long does it take to take it off, top on or off? Do you have one of those pulley things? Well, uh, it's got the, the front bits. They're super easy to take off, which is just over the driver's seat, uh-huh. the passenger seat. But the full back is – that's a bit of a situation. Yeah, you need the pulley situation or like two dudes. I used basically. to have a Jeep. It was as cool as yours, but Jake Owen bought me a thing you put in your garage, and it like lifts it up. But that thing was harder to put up than take the top off of the Jeep. <laughs> yeah, I got one of those uh, at my old place, and um, I, I, it arrived from Amazon, and uh, I tried to put it up. It's just a bunch of like little hooks and um, ropes. And I tried to put it up while drinking beer one night. And uh, it wasn't until the next morning that I came down and tried to use it and realized I'd done it completely, completely <laughs> wrong and had to do it that morning over some coffee and, and fix it. But it did work really well once it got done. You, you love the Jeep? I feel like that's part of your brand. Like you can't, you can't drive like a Honda Civic. Right. You I'll, can't drive even – let me go with something real. You, if you drove up in a Maserati, I would be like, uh, that doesn't fit. Right. Man, man, I actually, I got the Jeep after, um, I went on a holiday, I went to Hawaii and I rented a Jeep and had the most amazing time. Um, uh, it was in Kauai. It's one of my favorite places in the world. And I, it just felt so good. And I went and test drove this thing and it felt like a toy. It still feels like a toy car and feels like a vacation when I get in it. And, um, is that your only car? That's it. Yeah. I still have my old truck that I, it was the first thing that I bought when I moved to America. I can't bring myself to sell that, but, um, that's the that's the daily driver. You ever been trapped? Because in my Jeep, I got trapped in a storm with no top. I, I, there's been some some moments where I thought I was going to get trapped. I know the feeling, but I haven't I haven't been hit. I didn't know there. Again, I know nothing about cars. Right. So what I didn't know was once your Jeep fills up with water, because that's what mine did. I was near the radio station, drove to work, didn't look at the weather. Big storm, nowhere for me to go. The thing's filling up with water. The the the, the floorboards, the everything. Really? And I drive home, I just let it, and I'm like, God, so I didn't, I'm just letting it, like, dry. And one of my buddies comes over and goes, why is your Jeep full of water? I was like, I was in a storm, bro. And he goes, walks over, boom, boom, pulls the two plugs out of the bottom, yeah. drains in, like, five seconds. <laughs> Had no idea. <laughs> right. Never read the manual. Was it just slushing around? Yeah, as the, around it was, like, corners. sitting, standing water just in the Jeep. Amazing. So I, I'm not really a masculine, in many ways, a masculine guy when it comes to cars or fighting or beer. Sports, I'm in. I'm in more than I should be. Okay. But that's like my only saving grace. Yeah. Or I think I just, I, I would say I think I would just not be masculine. But I know like women who aren't masculine at all who are more masculine than I am in many ways. I think that's an old school masculinity though, isn't it? If you know about it, you know that's about true, it. That's true, but I'm from a very small town in Arkansas in the south where everything is still like, <sighs> you know? Yeah. So I'm sure I, my I, hometown's I, like that too. Yeah. Well, anyway, yeah. good to see you. You too, mate. Um, I feel like you're very hard to be friends with, and not because it's who you are. It's just because of what you do, what I do, but mostly what you do. And I feel like you're traveling internationally more than I remember you ever traveling internationally. Is that true or false? Uh, yeah, well, it's been a wild few months, actually. I just realized on the weekend, it was the first weekend I'd spent in Nashville in three months. So, yes, specifically this really? last little period has been pretty wild, yeah. There have been a couple times we've tried to get together. You'd be gone or... I'd be somewhere, you want to do this? You want to play pickleball? You want to get together? Yeah. It's like, all right. Wake up, ready to go. Hour later, we got to play pickleball now. I get a call. Hey, man, I'm in California. Sorry. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> I've definitely been taking advantage of the whole, like, wait a minute. Is there, like, a wave coming in at that beach? Can I get to that beach in time for it? I'm going to go surf for the next two days. So. Oh, you know what happened? There's been that, too. I told you about you and I, no, I guess it was. I guess it was Brett. You and I played pickleball. Was that when I locked myself out of my car? Oh, yeah. You didn't tell me, though. That's right. I did. I, okay. <laughs> I knew I told you this, but I didn't tell you this then, right? It, I didn't know at the time until well, When did I tell you this? Um, I think it was just the next time I saw you. So, whatever the case. Mike, do you know the story? Uh, I think so. Were we somewhere with them? I, I don't know. I tell so many stories from radio to shows. I'm pretty sure you told us. So, on this... On the radio show. I was playing pickleball with Morgan. He beat me. I was pissed, although he is better than I am. And it's like we played best of five. You win three to two. Hard-fought match, though. Give me some credit. Hard-fought match. Great game. New, new, new to pickleball. And 
I had realized I locked my keys in my car, which I didn't know could even happen because my car has this thing where you just hold the key near it and it opens, not the Bronco, like another car. Yeah. And I'm like, what the? And Morgan's getting in his Jeep, and I know I'm locked out. And I'm like, I'm not asking him for any assistance. This is stupid. I'm a loser, and I deserve to be a loser for the rest of the day, and I deserve to be punished by whatever I'm about to have to do with the keys locked out of my car. And that's what happened. And I well, sat there. From my perspective, though, as I was getting in the Jeep, it was like we just finished and sort of said our goodbyes. And as soon as I got in the Jeep, I looked out, and you're on the phone, like looked like hard at work. I was like, man, Bobby's busy. He just goes He's out. He's a it. busy guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was actually going, uh, hey, dealership, is there any way you can unlock my car? <laughs> and they were like, no, have you signed up for the app? And I was like, no. And so for like 30 minutes, we tried to get in. We couldn't. Then I had to Uber home to get the keys to Uber back. Uh, and then it took me an hour and a half. But I deserved that. You know why? Because I lost pickleball. And that was my mindset. It wasn't that I didn't think that you would drive me home. I live 10 minutes away. Yeah. It wasn't it that. Been You'd have been way easier. It would have been. Yeah. You know what? I didn't deserve that. Because when the chips were down, I lost and I failed. And because of that, I needed to get my comeuppance. Well, I think that's ridiculous, but thank you for telling me that eventually idea. that you lock yourself out. I got like eight stories. I'm just, I just feel like I'm pouring them out of me here. And then you and I are supposed to be teamed together in the charity pickleball tournament. Yeah. Now, this is not a shot at Chris Lane because Chris Lane's a better athlete than I am. Yeah. Chris Lane was a college baseball player. Mm -hmm. But he didn't know how to play pickleball. And all, the no all of a sudden, I get a call going, hey, you've been switched. You and Morgan are on a team. Now it's you and Chris. And I'm like, oh, cool. Chris is a great athlete, too. Don't know him as well as I do Morgan, but I'm sure we'll do fine. Right? Mm -hmm. we, it's all so we show up, and I was going to play possum and act like I didn't know how to play. That was my plan going into it. Oh, and be right. like, I don't know the rules, even though I'd been playing a decent amount since you and I played. Yeah. I was like, I don't know the rules. Okay, so what? That's called the lobby? No, that's called the kitchen. Oh, I was going to do that. But then when I get there, and Chris is on my team, and he really doesn't know the rules. I, we, I can't. He's asking me the rules, and I don't want to lie and be like, I don't know. I can't play possum to my own partner. Right, 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 right. Especially if he is it genuinely my, feeling yes, that he didn't way. Know. Yeah. He said, I never played in my life. I watched uh, TikToks this morning on the rules. And I'm like, oh. So here's my question to you. I didn't watch those games because we were playing at the same time. Yeah, you were winning with do, your partner. Do you, I, I was very lucky in my partnership, yeah. actually. But um, did you actually believe him when he said he never played before? Because I played in a, a ping pong tournament with him a few weeks prior to that. He's an excellent ping pong player. And he, he dominated. He won the whole thing. He's a great athlete. Yeah. I do believe him. I did believe him, and I do believe him because I, I played with him. You watched him. <laughs> okay. And if he needed to move or cut, he's great. But again, there are just um, some some rules and some you know intricate details of that sport. Yeah. Like where you can stand when you hit it. Little yeah. that he didn't know, and we kept losing points. And I was right. trying so hard not to be frustrated, but I hate losing. We lost so bad, I almost went and locked my keys back in my car again just to experience that punishment yet again. Right. Your partner was who? My partner was Philip Phillips. Exactly. One of the greatest pickleball players in music history. Yeah, it seems like it, actually. I mean, he is a sensational player, and we did win the, um, the amateur part of that tournament, but I will have to say that Philip Phillips definitely carried our team along. You guys ended up beating Dirks? We did, yeah. I didn't know you guys won the championship. Yeah, it happened. Look at this. I get somebody who's never played, and Morgan gets the greatest musical pickleball player in the history of pickleball, I was talking to Philip. I'm like, hey, man, do you play? He's like, man, all the time. He said, like, we're in a league. We play all the time. Yeah, you could tell by the clothes he showed up in, I too. He, he was looked a like a professional. Yeah, he did. He did. <laughs> he did. And it actually, so it came down, like, in the normal, like, the, the normal competition, we, uh, we were up against Dirks and Ben. Uh, Dirks is a guitar player who's an amazing pickleball player, too. And, um, and so is Dirks. And, and we lost to them. And then we went into the, like, whatever the other round is. And then we won our way back to the final against them. And then we beat them. And so the final was actually this full game where you play two points of singles and then the other two players swap in and out. So it was Ben and Philip Phillips who were both great players and then Dirks and I against each other and first to 11 and we just got away with it. Well, congratulations to you for getting a much better partner than me. I, <laughs> yeah, I was thank pissed. You. I don't know. I, I deserve any congratulations to that. But, I was uh, pissed. Yeah. Not because it's Chris, but because Chris, because Chris never played and I knew that if I had a teammate that had played, we had a chance to win the thing. But whatever. Would you get a trophy or something? Uh, they gave us a, a, a paddle. Didn't you think those pros were awesome? Yeah. I, I was actually shocked. I I, um, I grew up playing tennis, and so like I, I was very aware of the difference between a pro tennis player and an amateur tennis player that thought they were okay. But um, pickleball is one of those things you can't tell when you watch a video if it comes up on your Instagram or whatever um, versus in, in real life you can really see how much better they are. than. It's just like... First yeah. of all, it's a lot of dinks over the net. Yeah. Which... 
I never do because I don't know why. I, I didn't right. know why you would do that, but you're playing two on two or doubles as they call it. Yeah. I'm from the streets. We call it two on two. <laughs> two on two. I love it. Basketball, yeah, pickleball, yeah, yeah. whatever. And so it's you get up and you dink, dink, and you just dink it at little angles until somebody screws up and dinks it a little too high. What? Then it's just wah, da, da, da. and the reflexes of these people. Da, 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 da. Wild to see. Yeah. Who thought pickleball would take such athleticism? Yeah, it's pretty wild. A lot of those, um, a lot of those guys and girls are all kind of ex-pro tennis players as well, or maybe they're tennis pros in their hometown or, or whatever, and now they're like you know, taking on this new sport and doing really well. My friend Andy Roddick won half a million dollars playing a tournament. Well, there you go. With a yeah. torn meniscus in his knee. He's a, oh, oh, really? He tore it the day <laughs> before the tournament. Yeah, right. I mean, he's about as elite as a, an athlete can get, though, I he guess. He never even played. He texted me and was like, you ever play pickleball? I said, yeah. He said, you any good? I said, I, and I was thinking about you specifically and Brett, because I beat Brett a few times. But I didn't beat you. And I was like, you know what? I can play with them. I wouldn't say I'm better than the guys that are pretty good here, but I can I can compete. Okay. I said, why? Are you going to start playing? He goes, start playing no. Am I going to play once? Yes. I said, what are you doing? Because I'm going to play a tournament. And I said, yeah, why? He goes, it's for a million dollars. And I was like, oh. He goes, I just signed the contract. I never played in my life. And so I'm like, oh, that's all. And so then I kept keeping track. Like, how's it going? How's it going? And he, te- he would text me. And then the day before, he's like, I, I tore the meniscus in my knee. I don't know what I'm going to do. And all, I swear to you, all I'm thinking of is, can I bet on this? Because I'm bet against him. If I could have found a place to bet. <laughs> oh, you knew I, about the injury. Yeah. I thought I had inside information. It was listed nowhere. Right. Or I would have. Oh, and this is the same guy who, when I went on Dancing with the Stars, because I was at like 40 to 1. I think he put $2,000 on me to win. I was the worst odds. That's the same guy who bet on me to win. I was going to bet against him. Wow. True friendship. True friendship. <laughs> <laughs> now, the best thing about p- pickleball, though, is as good as the pros are and, and how amazing that experience was, is that it's one of those games where you don't have to be very good Agreed. to have a good time. You can get to be pretty good pretty quick. Yeah. We had, like, my whole band and crew last weekend out on the road. We set up a net. Like, half of them never even played before, but they're all, like, kind of semi-athletic dudes and... We ended up having a great game after mm-hmm. like 15 or 20 minutes. So that's the best thing about the sport to me. My trainer, also my friend, his name's Kevin Klug, and we have a court in the backyard. It's a tennis court that we've turned into a little pickleball court. Nice. And so, and we just did it recently, but he's like, I never played before. And he's just played college football like he's jacked, right? Right, right. And he's like, oh, and like he's trying to kill it at first. But like three games in, he's like, oh, I get it. And then he became obsessed with it like most people do. The strategy. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty good. It's yeah. a pretty good game. What So... How, surfing is your number one, though, if you're going to do something active. Like, you'll chase. You'll fly around the country to surf. A world, I should say. Well, now, yeah, because I live here and there's no, there's no waves here. But I'm saying you will, li- you will travel, though. To, like, you will purposefully seek out somewhere to go just to have a great surf. Is that what you call it? A great surf? Good surf? Yeah. That, yeah? Yeah. Like, how was your surf? Did anybody ask that question ever? Great. Yeah. But, but is that actually asked? Like, how was your surf? Yeah. How were the waves? Yeah, great. I think you did well. Ask me how my, how would you ask me how my day of surfing was? How was it? No. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> how was the surf? That's how you would say how yeah, was the surf. Yeah, how was the surf, yeah. Yeah. Did you get out this morning? Did you get any? Did, okay, yeah. now this is the yeah, lingo yeah, yeah. I was okay, looking cool, for. Okay, cool, cool, yeah, yeah. Did you get out? Yeah, was it fun? Did you get out, meaning were the waves acceptable enough for you to take your board and enter the water? Yes. And I think the, the conversation maybe depends who you're talking to. If I was talking to a pro surfer or some of my mates that I know that take it very seriously, it would be very different to some of my mates that just have long boards out in L.A. and kind of, you know, smash around on the weekends. But either way you go, it's a fun time. Where's the best place in the world that you have been that you have surfed? Oh. Um, man, there's lots. There's lots of great places. The, when I say, though, the best place you've ever been, and you can even – associate with a single time or adventure you've had at that place where is the best place you have been the best time best surf you've ever had um i do remember a really fun week when uh one of my mates who is australian indonesian he got married in bali and we all went to bali for the wedding and uh i did get amazing waves there um all around like on almost every coastline of that place which was pretty awesome that was a long time ago now but I still remember some of the waves from that, so that's good. I had a session at home in Australia as well, uh, in Byron Bay, which has now become a, quite a famous place. Um, that was pretty. That was pretty old time too. Is surfing like pizza, where even if it's not that good, it's still real good? Yeah. Well, 
I mean, I'm sure it's different for everyone, but for me, I didn't realize how much of a big part of my life it was. It, even like not necessarily just the surfing aspect, but being near the ocean, spending time in the ocean. There's so many aspects to that, obviously being outside, being active, being in the salt water, but also like just being quiet for a second. Also understanding the power of the ocean, how small that makes you feel. And there's something sort of meditative about surfing too when you're on the wave. You, ca you can't, I mean, maybe you can, but you don't. You don't think about anything else other than what you're doing at that exact time. And that's a very kind of relaxing place to be, uh, at least for me. Um, that's a, a state that I find aspirational now. So uh, I didn't realize how much I was going to miss that until I didn't have it anymore and sort of felt myself looking for things that made me feel like that, you know? The only time I have that or I'm so consumed in something that I'm thinking of nothing else is when I'm playing Madden football on PlayStation. There you go. Yeah. I'm nowhere cool. It's not nature, but it's like I'm so focused. Yeah. I got to figure out the defensive scheme to stop, well, the computer. But I tell my wife, like, that's my where I, what I can do and just yeah. almost be mindless. Yeah. Because I'm thinking about it. And, yeah, you make people make fun of me. But I can almost escape what feels like the gears never stopping mm. in my mind. Yeah. When I'm sitting there on the video game. Well, it's like it's that that balance of like you're fully engaged. Your brain is fully engaged in what you're doing, but like the the monkey mind as they call it is being kind of eliminated because you don't have mm -hmm. space for it. You need to focus it all on this one thing. So for me that's what that is. That's it's not like I've never aspired to be a great surfer or the best like a you know anything like that. It's just a it's a physical and mental experience that um, I grew up with and, and I feel like I need. Are there people from where you're from that ended up turning that into a career, like a pro career, pro surfers? Is that much, Is that big in your town since you're near the coast? Yeah, I mean, there's, um, there's a, a – there's, yeah. I grew up with some guys that were really good for sure and um, uh, some of them took it really seriously. And, I mean, pro surfing is tough, man. Like unless you're in that top twenty, like it's a tough sport to be um, to be in. And some of them went and sort of chased after that, and some of them made a, a distinct choice to say, "This is the thing that I love most in my life. I'm going to keep it as that, and not try to sort of mess with it in a professional way." I and guess I'm wondering about sports culture where you're from, and I ask this because we, me, you, Brett, went up to Iowa to watch a. Arkansas basketball game. Yeah, that was fun. And, it, and was I remember fun. you being like, "We don't. This is not how call. This is not college in Australia. Right. Where everybody gets together." And there, there were like four schools there too, and it wasn't even like super. Like uh, people just going banana. I mean, I was going bananas, but like it wasn't just people. You were, which was great to see, by the way. Oh, it's my favorite thing in the whole world. Yeah, like, I, that's yeah. it. That's that's my favorite place. Yeah. But so, what did you have collegiate athletics in Australia, and were they as? As, as big as they are here, but just different sports? There is. I'm sure there is. But where you're from, like where, what you grew up around and were exposed to? I think the main difference in Australia is with, with the, like the big mainstream sports is there's no rules on when you can turn pro or go pro. So like if you're an extremely talented rugby player or rugby league player when you're 16 or 17. So rugby is a major sport. If you go there first, that's a major sport you grew up around. Yeah, yeah. Uh, rugby, rugby league, AFL, and cricket, I would say, are the main ones. What's yeah. the difference in rugby and rugby league? <laughs> it's like there are very slight differences. It's kind of ridiculous how, how similar they are. Um, it's a, isn't it the same game, though? They're similar concepts, yeah. Like if you maybe if you watched it, like not knowing, if you didn't know either of the sports, you might be confused at first. I mean, if you know the sports at all, you can tell. But, same um, ball? Similar ball, yeah. Not even the same ball. One has like a slightly more curved slightly more pointy ends why would you play one and not the other i think historically and i people will probably call me out for this if it's if it's wrong please do but i think historically one was more of a working class version of the game and one was more of an upper class version of the game and so i played the working class too. they uh well my town was definitely the working class version of the games the the rugby league and the newcastle knights is my home team which will always always be my team but um yeah they're the two major kind of rugby sports and then cricket, and AFL as well, which is bigger in different parts of Australia than where I grew up in. When I went to Australia, I thought it felt like a very friendly San Diego. Everything about it except people drove on the other side of the road. Yeah. I thought it, it, was, it felt very much like America and where I was. Now, I was in Sydney, right? I was in the city. Right. And I remember everybody being cool, and then I remember I, I saw a bunch of people 
gathered at a sporting event. I'm like, let me go check that out. And I went, and it was a cricket match. Yeah. I know what the crap was happening. Yeah. People were wearing chicken buckets on their head or something. There, is that ring a bell? Do wear buckets on their head? Or is that just that one team that was doing that? Um, I don't know. I mean, it must the, be a one team. There's then. every possibility. They like often there'll be a theme around a specific game or something like that, or a big charity event around a specific game. But um, it was like baseball and lacrosse, yeah, and like um, horse polo without the horses. Like that's what it, that game felt like. Where I didn't really know, but I felt like the goal was to keep the ball and play, and you could also hit the ball behind you. Yep. And the games would last days. Yeah, five, there's a five-day version of that game, yeah. What? What? Yeah. I how know. many outs? What's that? Uh, how many? I, I don't even know the questions to ask. About. There's two teams. Um, they each get two, but how many two outs? innings. Um, Did you play two innings in five days? Yeah, if you can, it can go for five days. It can end early, too, though, if one team really dominates. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. I guess I just am drawn to sports. but I'm such a sports guy here, so I'm so curious about it. Very similar cultures, but that have completely different sports cultures. Yeah. Well, they're, they're pretty similar. I mean, they're similar. I would say that baseball is our um, – is like cricket. Cricket and baseball would be like interchangeable. And then like NFL uh, football would be interchangeable with rugby or AFL or rugby league, whichever code you follow the most. You but know? basketball, do you guys follow NBA there? Um, yes. Uh, there was – there has been like – Pro basketball leagues in Australia on and off. There was when I was a kid, and I used to love going to it, actually, in my hometown. But um, through the years, it's, it's been less. And, and honestly, I think uh, the most promising basketball players in Australia generally try to, you know, they want to be over here and competing on the level that happens in this country. Are you a pop artist over there? Um, I mean, I'm definitely a country artist, but um, they do play, they play a they're playing a lot of country music in Australia at the moment. And that's the answer. Pop artist to me means are you getting played on top 40 playlists or stations? Are you being put in top 40? Because top, I worked in pop forever, but it just meant the most popular music. Like right. we play Papa Roach, Cut My Life, and then we play yeah. Britney Spears, and then we play Jay-Z. Yeah. Right? So I guess there are you popular well, yeah, I mean, we just put a tour on sale uh, last night and uh, I did three hours of press yesterday and I spoke to all of the pop radio stations in and Australia. How'd, how'd it go? Did you sell tickets? It went really well, actually. That's awesome. We were adding shows in pretty really? much all the cities, which is really cool. Good for you. I'm, yeah. We're about to do that. I'm going to list some cities. I'm going to do like eight to ten cities. Yeah. I don't know if you're like me, but I get, I get really nervous. Dude, I get so nervous, too. I get so nervous, too. And then, like, you know, for it to go well, it's like the biggest, like, wave of, Good feelings, but also a sigh of relief, you know? I get so nervous. It, it, <laughs> How does that show up for you? How does no show up for you? In that situation, I because I'll do theaters, and each seat is accounted for. Like, you literally buy seats, theater seats. Yeah. So it's not like a show that would have, like, a um, amphitheater with a GA part of it. Or right, right. a club where you go, how many tickets? 236. Okay, well, we need to sell whatever more. So I'll do theaters that are around 1,500 to 2,000 people. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't sell 65 to 75% in the first weekend, I might kill myself. That's what I think. Jeez, dude. Yeah, the, the, and <laughs> I've been lucky enough that a lot of them yeah. sell out. They do well, okay. Or do 80%, 85%. But yeah. I'm like, I'm just so scared that, well, I guess I'm over. And I'm irrelevant now, and nobody cares. Like, I'm... I'm petrified of that. And so that's what I think. Well, if I don't sell 50 to 65%, because that's kind of the, what the data says, if you can sell that, you can still sell out a show. So if I'm like, if I don't, I might just kill myself. Here's a question I have for you. You do so many things. Uh, how do you think of yourself? Like, uh, are you a, a radio guy that does this other stuff? Are you a TV personality that does radio music? Are you a music guy first that does, like, how do you think about that? I'm a radio guy. For sure, number right. one, number one. But uh, radio is is this. Radio is any sort of audio. I'm an audio guy. That's what I should say. I, I feel first and foremost like I'm an, a long form audio guy, because I feel like that is where bonds are made. Yeah. I know I listen to shows, like a podcast I listen to is part of my take. It's a sports show. Two guys I never met in my life. They don't know who I am, but I feel like I know them, mm. and like I depend on them. And I, I Bill Simmons. Like I roll with Bill Simmons every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Like, I have this relationship with them because I spend 
Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, or whatever the case is, I spend two and three hours with these people. Mm. And so it takes me to have that relationship to understand what people have with me. Yeah. And so that's why, first and foremost, I'm an audio guy. Yeah. Radio, podcast, whatever the case is. And then after that, I just throw crap against the wall and hope something sticks because I just don't feel like I'm that mm. that dynamic at anything. So I try to jump in head first and learn as much as I can, as fast as I can. Mm. But stand-up comedy, that's all I did. I was like, oh, i never done this before. Whew, here we go. And I went from ter- – it's like pickleball. I went from terrible to pretty good pretty quick. Can I just jump in there? Yeah. Stand-up comedy is nothing like pickleball. It is completely terrifying to me, the it idea of doing that. Absolutely. I'll give you the terrifying part. But I'm, I get terrified of heights, not right. of looking like a fool. Right. I'm okay with that. I've done it my whole life, looking like an idiot. And I can work quick on my feet. Like, I do know my skill is that, is working quick. So I would say that with stand-up, it was like pickleball to me, where I got pretty good, relatively in a, in a timely manner. I won't say fast, but it's going from pretty good to good. That's mm-hmm. Unless you're doing it every day, it's almost impossible. Mm. Like, it is such, such a craft and such a skill and something you have to hone every night. And I have friends who do it as a career. That's why I, I will never call myself a comedian. And I can sell more tickets than a lot of my friends. I can sell more tickets doing a comedy show than a lot of my friends who are comedians, but they're still way better of a comedian than I am. Right. Now, I think I'm getting pretty good still. I'm getting a little better. Yeah. I went. I did a 10-minute set at the Opry last night. I mostly new stuff. And the Opry's a tough crowd because they're older. And right. some of the stuff doesn't work on. And it was good. And I walked off going like, man, I'm, I might be getting pretty good at this. That's usually met with a real bomb soon. Okay. But that, to me, I'm an audio guy. I love doing comedy. TV is super easy and cool. That's like the, uh, the fancy jewel. Mm-hmm. And then writing books sucks. It's just so much. It's just so much work. It's the worst. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's terrible. Worst part of the job. But, I mean, I created the job. But it's the wor- worst part of the job. I hate it. I hate every second of it. Because it's just nonstop. And you pour over it and you have to relive all this crap that you already went through because you want to put the crap out there and you want to put the good stuff out there and you're reliving these traumas and someone's then looking at it going, yeah, this uh, here where you talk about the uh, drug addiction, oh, can you make that a little funnier? And you're like, man, I... <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, I you know? hear you. I hear you. Yeah. So what about you? Would you say that you are a, first and foremost, are you a songwriter? Are you a singer? Are you... I don't know. How would you define what you do as your favorite part of it? Because you are all of it, just like I am all of these things. Yeah. What are you? Uh, I think I started as a. Um, I start. I think I started as an entertainer. I think that's like the first. I remember the first gig that that I went to play as a thirteen year old. Um, like literally thirteen. Like we forced me and my mate forced my eleven year old brother to learn how to play bass guitar to play this gig, and. Uh, I didn't even think about it. I was like, oh, we better write some songs for this show. So you got the show before you wrote the songs, then you thought, well, we got a show coming up. We better write some songs. Yeah, and Love they it. were the first the first songs I wrote. And I'm, they were terrible. I'm not saying they were good songs, but that was kind of the uh, um, the impetus to write to write those songs. And uh, I think more and more, um, especially, you know, having lived in this town for a little while and worked in this town for a little while, um, the songwriting part is the part that I've fallen in love with more. And I think that's probably evened out over the last... However, about seven or eight years since I got here. So, entertainer first, and then the, you start to love the other things. Yeah. You start to love songwriting. Yeah, and I think, you know, so I, th- I would consider myself a songwriter, a singer-songwriter now, like what in the you, true sense of the word. I would, I would consider you that. I would yeah. consider you a singer-songwriter. Um, what do you – a, it's a weird, vague question, but what do you feel like is the best song you've ever written that when you listen back to it – you you don't question any small part or how the bridge got there or that lyric. What do you feel that has been recorded is the best song you've ever written? Um, well, as I mean, in terms of things that I don't want to go back and change, I think "Over for You" is probably is probably that that song. "Over for You" and "On My Own Again" both feel like very pure representations of where I was at a time. I would also say a song called Dance With Me on my first album would be that as well. Like, they sound um, exactly the way that I intended them to. When you... You, did, oh, you, you said, 
Over, what was the second one you said? Over for you, on my own again. Okay, on my own again. When that came out, <clears throat> that had nothing to do, and you can correct me if I'm right or wrong, that had nothing to do with your relationship status, right? Didn't you already have that song and you were putting it out and people were just saying that, just drawing conclusions, or did it? No, that was a chorus that was written kind of sort of shortly after all it, that it was? stuff went down. Yeah, Because I remember it coming out and seeing it on Instagram, and maybe I just made that story up in my head, and people were like, uh... And you were like, uh... Well, the other two songs... Um, Maybe that's what The other two songs that came out on the Life Upside Down EP were from um, May last year. We started recording those. So they sort of... There was no, like, chrono chronology that made sense there with those. What were those titles? Let me see if I could make that work. Uh, hey Little Mama and All Right Here. Yeah, hey Little Mama does not work to be angry at you for that one. What was the other one? All Right Here? Yeah. You're hard to associate with those. Hey Little Mama. Mike, will you play me a little bit of this? Mm -hmm. Here you go. I, I look at, because I played this on the, our Country Top 30, our countdown, and I played the song, and I remember looking at the songwriters on it, and it was like Laura Veltz, yeah. you, Jamie, jo Josh, Josh Thompson, and Jamie. Oh, okay, so Josh and Jamie. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's a pretty, pretty powerful little group of songwriters there. Did you guys do that together? Yeah. Uh, Josh was on, uh, on Zoom, so he was up on a screen, kind of like this in the studio, but yeah, the four of us did it. Is that the only song you wrote that day? Yes. I've written a number of songs with um, Jimmy and Laura, um, but that was the only one we wrote. As That's why I was asking because yeah. they're, they're, I've seen them listed in, in your songs before. I wonder if you'd written them. When you record Hey Little Mama, and there's that title, Hey Little Mama. I don't know. Like, Hey Baby, Hey Little Mama. What did you think? People are going to think I'm like, hey, sweetheart. Or no? People are going to think. You know, because, you know, dudes being like, hey, baby. Hey, sweetheart. Hey, little sugar lips. You know, like, did, yeah. you, did that come in your mind at all? Like like feeling like an old guy hitting on a young, like a 16-year-old? <laughs> <laughs> I guess it didn't. That, that didn't come into my mind. And it, and it shouldn't I, have. Otherwise, I probably like, wouldn't have written it, it like that. Like, hey, little mama. No. Oh, I know. thought it was a cute nickname at the time. Got it. And yeah. it probably is. Yeah. yeah. Probably is. Yeah. Thanks, though. I hope I no, think I don't want that every time I, I don't. I don't want that to stick. And I like the song so much. Like I said, I played it on the countdown, and I think it's a really catchy song. Thank you, Matt. But I wondered when you were like, hey, baby. I don't know. Just hey, don't... hey, Sugar Lips will be the follow-up. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Will yeah, be yeah. the follow-up song. Mike, yeah. are you, like, picking up what I'm putting down at all? Not really, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Because I, I just would never say to some, maybe it's because you're just better looking and like more of like a dude, like hey little mom. I could never pull that off. Well, maybe that's what I'm jealous of. It's not like a stranger. Let's thing. get to the root of it. I'm insecure. You're not walking down the street saying hey little mama to people. I think it's, like, it's not a cat calling song. No, no, it's uh -huh. not like the whistle. It's like a, it's an endearing one. I think. Okay, know? well, I still couldn't pull. If I went into my house right now, and my wife is over there right now, I said hey little mama, she would laugh out loud at me. Well, you couldn't do it like that. You can't trail off at the end. Hey, little mom. <laughs> no, I don't do it. Hey, little mom. <laughs> Look, I believe in you. I believe in you. I think all my insecurity, it, 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 it went to a head. I thought, at first it was like, hey, baby. No, it's just I can't pull it off. So I feel like I'm jealous of people who can pull off something like, hey, little mama. And people don't laugh at them. Do you have a, do you have a nickname that you use? You, is it just babe? Hey, baby, or something like that? Yeah, babe, probably. Yeah. There you go. But you didn't come out with that straight away, right? You graduated to that after a little while of... Her real name is Babe. It's Babe Caitlin. <laughs> it's, her, it's her literal real name. Okay, okay. I'm glad I asked that. We, yeah, me we too. We got to the root of my insecurities there. Um, on the Life Upside Down EP, I just want to roll through some of these real quick. Over for you... A little more musical, a little more sonic. Is that sonically a little different? It's in the original version, or have I just heard you play it on piano so many times, I'm just associating that? Yeah, there is a live version of just me, like a vocal piano. Okay. That's what I have heard so many times. Mike, will you play this again? When that song... I just want to know what was going through your head the first time you played it because I don't think you had any intention 
of it going viral because you didn't post it. That's the thing. There's no way you could have had intention because you didn't post it. Some random um, fan of yours posted on TikTok. Mm. Before you go play it, do you, is it a safe place where you feel like nothing you say or play is actually going to leave that room? Or are you going, all right, I'm going to go play this song. It's very personal. And it'll probably get out, and it is what it is. Um, well, the first time I played it was at a festival in Australia. Called Wasn't C that time that it was recorded? It was. Oh, yeah. it was. Okay, got it. It was a, a festival in Australia called CMC Rocks, and I uh, walked over to the piano, and it was the biggest headline show we'd ever played before. And um, uh, there was a lot going on at that time, and it was a really weird time of life. And uh, I just but for you to play that song, I just want to know what you're thinking as you play it. As far as the song, the life of the song, are you going? This thing is going to exist now, or are you doing like I do, where I'm like, I'm gonna test some jokes out, and if they don't work, I'm either gonna fix them or I'm never doing them again. I don't think it wasn't. It was so not premeditated that I didn't think about that stuff. It was a, I'm walking to the piano now. I feel like I need to play this song right now. That was it. Did you have it, it, it in your mind that. that you would play that song before the set started? Or was it a, I might pivot and do this? Um, it's kind of an open section of the set. It's a set where, a part of the set where I go over and I play piano and there's any one of like three or four songs I could play. And we had written this song the week before. Um, but... I, I, it was, I mean, I, was, I guess there was a possibility that I could play it, but not enough that I'd practiced it enough, which is evidenced by the fact that if you lis listen to that first um, version that went viral on TikTok, it's actually in a different key than the actual no, song. No one notices that but you. And the, I wouldn't even notice that. The reason I noticed is because I went to the chorus. I was like, oh, my God, this is so much higher than I wrote this song. <laughs> How am I going to get to these notes? And uh, I think it was purely for the fact that there was 22,000 people there. The amount of adrenaline in my body allowed me to sing that chorus that way. But, um, yeah, man, I, I don't know. I can't, that's one of those moments I can't really explain, but um, I'm grateful When you finished it, for. were you like, wow, how do I get back? How, oh, I got to get back to my set. I don't know. I've just, uh, I, I, I have a joke series that I haven't gotten to yet. It's about the history of country music, and it's about mm. how, and I'll relate this back to your story, but mm. I thought I might do it last night at the opera, and I didn't. Yeah. And I thought, if it feels right, I'm going to do it, but it's about the history of country music and how I get really annoyed at people who t say that things aren't country. And it's right. a very serious thing at the beginning, and it's, you know, I, you get a bunch of dudes with Copenhagen and their lip going, that ain't country, and they like to uh, hate on anything that isn't the music that they've been taught was traditionally country music. I said, but what ain't country is them because country music came from two places. You either got to be a black artist or a European artist, and the black artists came from Africa. They're the ones who brought the banjos. That's why the banjo is, from, is in the South. Like, they brought the banjo to America on slave ships. So country music, black artists, and European artists who had the fiddle. Mm. They met. They created country music. Mm. And so that if you want to root it back to what is really country, if you ain't European... Are you in a black artist? You ain't country. And so I do this, and I, it's, it's, that's the truth, and it's very serious. And I say, I don't want to run the whole joke here, but for the sake of this story, I say, <laughs> nothing that you guys think is country is country. Shania Twain, she's from Canada. She ain't country. Keith Urban, he's from New Zealand. He ain't country, and his last name's Urban. And then I go through whatever, and, and the joke ends up with, you know, and the songs. You know, Garth Brooks doesn't have friends in low places anymore. The lowest place his friend is when he's coming in on his G6. Or, you know, he's, he's calling Baton Rouge from his private plane. That kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it lightens up a little bit. And it's always a pivot place that I have if I feel really good about it or really passionate. And I haven't hit that spot yet. And I thought okay. I was going to do it last night. And that's why I ask about that song. Because it was a pivot place for you where you could have gone there. Yeah. And you did. Mm -hmm. And then when it's over, can you, not, can you stop thinking about it? for the rest of the set, or can you separate and just continue doing a really great Morgan show? <laughs> yeah, I mean, what was interesting about that is I went straight into an acoustic guitar moment of the show, and I played, like, a bunch of, like, for the just for the purpose of getting more songs in the set, I played, like, a medley of love songs straight after that, <laughs> which was, like, extra, extra epically <laughs> heavy, you know? Um, but it was, it was, there was, like, it was such a real human moment for me on stage and I think as someone that's kind of always kind of been more private that moment felt like a freeing kind of moment and 
I didn't realize it at the time until maybe after the show that like there was a weight lifted off my shoulders because I was like, oh, cool. I just was able to say that, do that. It was an amazing show too. It was an amazing feeling. The crowd was insane. Um, and went to bed going, cool, I think we did the biggest show of my career and I feel really happy about it, you know. And then it wasn't until the next morning we woke up and because of the time difference with Australia and America that, um, you know, people like you had played And I was going to ask you because you know? we don't talk work. We really don't talk work. We're together. I mean, just very rarely do we go, music. No, it's mostly pickleball. It's pickleball or it's like <laughs> live. Right, yeah, it's just hanging out. stuff, yeah, yeah. Or comedy stuff or podcasts that we're listening to. Like, it's like yeah. what two people talk about when they're just friends. Yeah. So this stuff, I don't get to ask you, but if, when you wake up and you, I've played it on my show, are you like, God dang it, dude? I mean, are you like, because that's okay. Are you like, why, like, why'd you make a deal out of this? Um, I think my first reaction was, God, I wish I played that in the right key. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, look, I, I, I can't. It was such a weird time, man. Like, uh, just emotionally and personally, that like, I can't like pinpoint an answer to that mm. question specifically. Did I disappoint you? Um, no. I mean, honestly, as as rough of a time that was, and as hard of a time that that song came out of, the way that I've related to people and connected with people through that song in the last six, seven months has been an extremely positive experience. And I noticed as soon as that happened when you guys played the song and, and people started to find out about it that, that all the comments and messages I was getting changed. But did know? that start it? I guess my, my it's not a fear because it already happened, but what I what my possibility is that makes me a little nervous and feel a little guilty is that and maybe I just, my ego is too big, but I feel like I was a part of the reason that a lot of the hard stuff that happened to you happened to you. Because if I just shut up and not played the song and just been like, no, oh, I'll just do something. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like that. And then, because I had you on the show right after, I feel like that kind of put a little target on you because of me. Nah, dude. Okay. If, if anything, I, I would say thank you. I, I will say, like, I'm the kind of, maybe, the kind of person that had I not played it and then you know sat on a song like that for more a few more weeks or a few more months or whatever and maybe it never came out i think that would be really like having the experience that i've had now it would be sad to think that, that song wouldn't have come out so uh, i'm really proud of it as a songwriter and as a person and um, i appreciate you sharing it with people yeah uh, you're probably still mad but and i don't know how <laughs> and uh i get off this but i don't know and you can say nothing. And I, if, I prefer you to say nothing. I just have to say this because people be like, you, just because you're your friend, you didn't ask a question. So I'm not even going to ask a question. I'm just going to say, I know the last few months have been extremely hard. Maybe not in the last few, but the, in the last eight months, it's been a very difficult time. And yeah. I wouldn't have had the composure that you have had. And I'm just making a statement. And if there's anything you want to say to that, you can. Or you can just say, cool, thank you. But I would not have had the composure that you have had because I would have been burning places down. I'd been, and I had to be in trouble, and it had been a bad decision for me. And I don't know what, if that's your parents that taught you. I don't know who it was in your life that gave you whatever mature, central part of your system that said, you know what, right now I ain't good, but it's going to be a lot worse if I do something dumb. Whoever did that, give them a medal because I compliment you on when it sucked real bad, you just sitting back and going, this too shall pass. Thanks, man. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you saying that. And I I am very grateful for um, a lot of the people in my life around me that um, that I work with, that I'm related to, and just friends, you know, that have been through similar versions of, of that. And um, that was the advice, and that was what I tried to stick to. And, um, yeah, I, and I really it. appreciate that's you it. saying it. Yeah, I remember telling you a couple of my stories where I was like, dude, you ain't going to believe this. Yeah. You know, like a like mob, like I don't want people giving me death threats. Mm. And like just it sucks when the internet the internet's rough. Every yeah. individual this is like sports team. Let me I compare it to sports teams. Yeah. I hate Tennessee volunteer fans as a group. Hate them. Hate them. Okay. I, I'd eliminate them from the planet if I could. Yeah. I think every single single person, like this individual people that love Tennessee football are awesome. Yeah. I never met a, an individual that loves Tennessee football that I don't like. They're amazing. But when they get to that fan base together, I just want to kill them. Same thing with Texas Longhorns. Right. Like, I just hate them so much. Individually, 
man, I, Austin's home to me. Yeah. Like individually, I got some great friends that coach at Texas that are big, but together as a group, I hate it. It's like the freaking internet. Yeah. All together, yeah. awful. Yeah. Individually, they're probably good people, but on the internet, just terrible. And when it gangs up on you, it sucks. It feels like the whole world's against you. Yeah. It's not a place that's set up for reasonable communication it or is conversation. Not. Yeah. It's like it's definitely and you see that especially with politics in this country. It's like it's set up for a place where like the loudest, most like outlandish voice or like um, you know, commentator. And that's will, who gets the attention, will the loudest get all, person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So is that weird for you here to see politics be so divisive? I mean, you you're here. You're one of us now, but Yeah. Is it it's not is it like that there has that spilled over? into Australia where now they're just going at each other as well? Um, it's it's less, it's less, um, way less than it is here for sure. Uh, oh, the football team thing is what made me think of that is because I feel like here you kind of, you kind of root for politicians the same way you oh, root yeah. for football teams and that's kind of just wild to me. But um, yeah, I, I just, I say that to say that it's not really about making sense of things. It's more about like, what team are we on? And like yell as loud as we can. And, you know, you just kind of, have to kind of acknowledge that so the ep of all five of these songs yeah over for you we do hey little mama let me do all right here mike oh, everything's all right here. it's my favorite one by the way thank you man yeah yeah it's a good one it's like bronco listening to music but when it's not raining yeah yeah, yeah, yeah on yeah. a sunny day bronco yeah music, i like yeah. that one and then uh here's let's do uh on my own again that he mentioned earlier So you're going away, you're going to do this tour, and tickets are pretty good? You need a big ticket plug here, or are you pretty sold out everywhere? Uh, we're doing yeah. American shows over the summer. Oh, you are? Which um, Haven't been announced yet? Uh, there's just a handful of headline things. We're doing some festivals, and we're doing some stuff with Billy Carrington, actually, which should be super fun. That is cool. Um, before we go to Australia in August. Billy Carrington has sneaky hits. There's a lot of them. Sneaky hits. Like, it's like, oh, yeah, look at that one. Oh, that one. Yeah. Oh, oh, my God. He's got like a lot sneaky great songs yeah man a lot, lot of them that sound good in the summertime too billy came to the studio i like billy billy came to the studio once and i think billy and i relate on the level of we don't really like it here sometimes right you know i love my wife and my dogs and my crew that i brought here i don't like this town that much industry wise and that's probably why i've not been very involved in it and it's probably why it doesn't like me sometimes and Billy kind of feels the same way. You know, he's like, I ain't living, I'm, I'm not staying in Nashville. Mm. And so I think we always kind of had that if he was living in Georgia or Hawaii, where he's at a lot now. And the last two times I've seen Billy, he's been like, hey, dude, take my number again. Come to Hawaii. Just come stay. You'll love, just come, you're, you're good. Just come stay with me in Hawaii if you want to come over. And I'm like, I don't know Billy well enough to just make plans and be like, I'm going to go see Billy. Right, right, right. But, like, for a dude to be like that. Yeah, that's fairly welcoming, isn't it? Yeah. Very welcoming. Yeah. Do you really feel like that? Like, the town doesn't like you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Town hates me. In what In what way? Uh, I never embraced it. I feel like there's, there are good people here. Yeah. I feel like, generally, it's just, for me, been people that want to be friends or use me to get to a higher, to use it as, for clout. Mm -hmm. to get on the show, to get on it. I, I felt that so much that even if it's not true now, I felt it so much that I can't shake it. And it's happened right. so many times where I'm like, oh, this person wants to be my friend, let's be friends. Oh, 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 I got the true intentions now. Mm -hmm. Where I've penalized my real friends for it early on, I've got one that I would consider a dear friend now, and he's in music, and we'd spent a lot of time together. And he was like, hey, I'm just letting you know I'm putting this song out. And... I've, I've not done anything country, and but it's going to come out, and it's doing this. It's a countryish thing. Mm. And he didn't tell me. He didn't say play it. He didn't say anything. Mm. But I was so. I quickly. I was triggered, mm. and I was like, "Oh, you're doing it too." I ain't talked. I didn't talk to him for weeks. Uh, and he was like, "Dude, what's up? What what, what what's happening here?" <laughs> and I was like, "Bro, bro, yeah, I got your." He's like, "No, no, no." And my wife had to like set me down and go like. Don't let those traumas from way early keep you from making friends. Mm. Now you can have whatever walls you need to have to help make you healthy. Yeah. But don't don't build extra walls now mm. to cut other people out of your life that are already in it. 
but this town for me in that way has sucked. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's a lot of people that have done, I won't say done me dirty, but have done things to make me feel like it's for a certain reason and it's not. Yeah. So that that's why I'm not a big fan of it. I feel like it's pretty dishonest. The industry is pretty dishonest. Yeah. I've had, I feel like obviously I've had p personal situation in the last little while, but like even before that, I find this town for, you know, country music, which is like the world we are kind of in, um, or LA for like my friends that are writers and actors and stuff like that. They're almost like the town versions of what social media is. Like every corner, there's someone else doing what you're doing seemingly better or like more successful or, and so there's this like hustle or pressure kind of feeling. And maybe that's my version of what you're talking about is like the, I'm not sure who or why mm. these relationships are happening. And, um, it's funny, like I, I kind of felt a little bit the way you're describing, um, at the end of last year about, about this town of like, God, why, what, this makes me feel just gross when I'm here at the moment. And then I went back to Australia um, for a month at Christmas and just like I went to my hometown I went and visited my grandparents or old mates I went for a road trip in my old van like up the east coast and um, then I came back to Nashville and it was like it felt almost new again in the way of like oh I remember why I came here and I see all the good things and I can acknowledge that kind of hustle feeling and sort of catch it before it takes over what I think of this place and um I just find like if you if you get out of this place and you come back with a, a perspective like kind of like the the fresh eyes kind of thing, um, that was super healthy for me. And uh, I feel like I've I've remembered what I love about the place, and I kind of just focus on that and try to enjoy that part of it when I'm here. That's sweet. I still hate it. Just the industry part of it. <laughs> like I think that the individually the people. Yeah, yeah. I like them. Yeah. The, but together it's like a football team or it's yeah. like the internet. Yeah. I hate it. It's okay. not for me. Yeah. Okay. I'd move tomorrow if I could. Right. I'd move tomorrow. I'd move to back to Austin. Right. Or to Fayetteville, Arkansas. Okay. But then have a place where it's warmer. I hate cold. But yeah, the industry is just gross to me. Yeah. And and there are it's one hard to escape. Yeah. Maybe when that's why. Yeah. yeah. Look, we've been here for an hour. Uh, here's the deal. Morgan's gonna be. Are you doing Brett Young stuff still? Or is that over? We just finished last week. How'd that go? Yeah, that was great, man. Yeah, that guy any good? Really fun. Is that guy any good? Yeah, yeah he's great, he's man. Good. Him and his old crew are awesome. I know. I like Brett. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brett's good. Um, okay, so the Life Upside Down EP, it's out. The Life Upside Down tour where Australia... We have a pretty big following in Australia on this podcast, believe it or not. Yeah. Who knew? Well, they no. love country music down Who there. Who knew? I didn't know. What do we do? Um, Australia and New Zealand this September, and then you're doing a bunch of shows here. Yep. In, in like summer festivals. Mm-hmm. Are you working on new music again already? Yeah, that's the plan um, over the summer. We have a handful of shows, but I'm mostly going to be here, um, yeah, making this next record. Have you done many interviews in America in the past three or four months? Um, I mean, I've done the odd like phone conversation about a show or something like that. This is the first time I've sat down, though. Really? Yeah. All right, well, and you don't hate me. <laughs> No, I okay. enjoy I enjoy your company, just mate. Just making sure. Yeah. I always felt a little guilty about that. About, about the, the song? Yeah, about taking the song and just playing the whole thing and being like, look at this. I do. This Light it on fire. Let's go. <laughs> Burn it down. You know how I am. No. I'll, go, I'll run at something. I don't, it, it may not break. I may not knock it down, but I'll run at it until I freaking knock my head off. Yeah. And I probably was like, ah. I don't think you knocked anyone's heads right. off. I like it. Yeah. Okay, there he is. Morgan Evans. Going to the, where are you going now? Where are you going? Airport? Uh, we're going to Minneapolis. Yeah. You ever been there? Going up, uh, yeah. We it's were, the opposite of Australia. It's we, the exact opposite. Of, <laughs> if there was one city that was opposite of where you're from, it's that one. Yeah, it gets pretty cold up there, right? Um, I've got a couple of good friends up there that I'm looking forward to catching up with them, and we're playing a show, and that should be really fun. Mike and I went, and we found the Mary Tyler Moore statue, didn't yeah. we? Yeah. You know who Mary Tyler Moore is? You're going to make it after all. Da, 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 da. I don't think I did. No. Yeah. No, She's no. A, she has a statue, though? In Minneapolis. Wow. Your homework assignment is to watch every episode of it and then come back and tell me about it. Mary Tyler Moore Show. Okay. I I associate Minneapolis with Prince. Also Prince. Yeah, okay. Paisley Park. All right. Yeah, is he, gonna, he there? He's going to come to your show? Is Prince going to come to the show? <laughs> I don't think so. Mate. All right. There he is, Morgan Evans. Yeah. You guys follow him at Morgan Evans Music 
on both Instagram and TikTok. Good to see you, buddy. Thanks, man. You're one of my favorite people in the whole world. And next time, I'll let you take me home and I'll lock my keys in my car. Deal? I would really enjoy you telling me that. Thank you, mate. Yeah, there he is. <laughs>